once again, good morning, everyone. So we're about to start our uh, presentation. So what I have said earlier, uh, the, uh, what I've shown earlier is the PAASE website. So if you wanted to know more about PAASE, so just uh, Google for the paase.org. Um, for today, this is one of the uh, REC 8 or uh, centers for the PAASE on Atmosphere and Webinar. And our hosting um, host for today is myself, Leto Naniola Jr. from UP Mindanao, and uh, Dr. Irineo uh, Eldit or June Porshot. So, Sir June, pwede mong pakita ang sarili mo so others can see you. Dali lang po. <laughs> Okay. It's okay. Hello, good morning. I'm in my office now. Thank you. Kumusta naman, Sir Jun? Luckily, we had our second dose of AstraZeneca. Oh, good. So I hope everyone gets vaccinated also so that we can be feel more free to move about and do our field work. Um, yes. So, uh, for this one, I'm really thankful that um, thing uh, facilitated because I was uh, I had limited abilities for the last few weeks. But uh, I hope we can all be helping each other today. So, welcome to the webinar today, and we have a very good uh, a very good uh, roster of prominent speakers. So, thank you. Back to you, team. Okay, thank you, uh, Sir Jun. So, by the way, uh, Mom Giselle just log in. Uh, I'm not so sure if she can uh, talk to us, but I'd like to invite her. Mom Giselle, do you want to say something? Yes, um, Ting and uh, Jun, thank you. I'm actually in the United States uh, wow. visiting uh, my newborn granddaughter, so I'm sorry that I was late. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for organizing this and uh, giving our um, uh, speakers a chance to talk about their work. And um, well, in the future, we work, welcome others to share their research uh, with uh, PASA members and uh, friends of PASA. And uh, this is like um, a round robin of um, webinars by our 14 recs, and I think this is the second to the last uh, webinar of our recs. So thank you so much to our three speakers. We look forward to your talks. Um, we know them well. They're all friends, Bell and Willie and Jerry and um, uh, Ting and uh, June. Thank you so much for organizing this. Thank, thank you, Mom Giselle. Hello. Hello. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Okay, that's it. I think we should get on with the introduction of our speakers. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank okay. you. So, thank you, ma'am Giselle. Okay, for today, uh, this is going to be a very informal discussion, so you can ask the questions to our uh, speakers. So, time tayo maging formal. Uh, we have three speakers for today. Si yung husband and wife na campus. I will introduce them one by one. And the other one is from the IESM or for the Institute of Environmental Science and Meteorology. Si uh, Dr. Jerry Bagdaza. So I'll start with uh, Belle. So I have known Belle for so many years right now. She was actually one of my former uh, boss during that time. And I think that was 1987. But that was a long time ago. So Belle uh, finished her BS Biology, uh, BS Marine Bio in UP Diliman. And then she also should, took up her uh, master's degree at the Marine Science Institute, also in UP Diliman. And then she went to Germany for her PhD. So Bell's work is mostly on invertebrates. 
her master's is on the scallops and uh, other things. She also worked on uh, reef fishes, just like myself. And, uh, and lastly, uh, Belle is actually a UP scientist. So I think uh, most of you are familiar what the UP scientist means. It's an honor for the faculty that deserve to be given this rank for having accomplished uh, academic uh, excellence. So, Bell, I think uh, you can start now for your presentation. So, maximum 20 minutes, so take your time, and then so the students can uh, ask some questions to you or our listeners. Thank I think, you. Bell, you can share your screen right now. Okay, Nabel. Kita ko na. Okay, yes. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much, King. Uh, hindi mo naman ata ako naging boss. Para si John lang naman ata ang boss natin. <laughs> anyway. You are the supervisors. <laughs> <laughs> Taga kulit lang. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about a rare opportunity we had in comparing the impact of two types of disturbances on the macrobenthic assemblages in a seagrass site, as the title there uh, uh, shows. Okay, seagrass beds, studies in seagrass beds suggest that these systems are important in providing food, shelter, and habitat. It, at, the, at the same time, it is also well accepted that seagrass macrobenthos serve as trophic links from the producers uh, from the uh, er, uh, yes from the low trophic levels to the fish or to the predators as they serve as food for many organisms. Despite their importance, however, few studies have been conducted on the dynamics and resilience of their communities. However, studies on the long-term variability of an assemblage or a community related to habitat characteristics are useful in differentiating natural variation from changes associated with human-induced or anthropogenic activities. Thus, this study uh, was conducted to examine the interannual variability of macrofaunal assemblages in a seagrass site affected by anthropogenic and natural disturbances in southern Guimaras, Philippines, specifically to determine species composition and other factors that influence macrofaunal interannual uh, abundance and taxonomic structure. The study was conducted at the Taklong Island National Marine Reserve, or TINMAR for short. It is a marine protected area or MPA, uh, established in 1990, uh, located in the southwestern tip of Guimaras Island. And Tinmar covers an area of about 1,100 hectares. It has an estimated 29 hectares of seagrass meadows, the most expensive of which, the Calaparan seagrass bed, is where sampling was conducted. Tinmar was subjected to two types of strong disturbances. The first of which was a massive oil spill, which took place in August 11, 2006. It is by far the largest in the oil spill in the country. It involved the release of 200,000 to 300,000 liters of bunker fuel from the empty solar one, okay, contaminating the entire Tinmar. Here is a picture here below of the sunken uh, ship. Then on June 21, 2008, the second disturbance, the super typhoon Frank with Fenshan as internal, international name, uh, struck Western Visayas with a wind speed of about 157 kilometers per hour. Extreme rainfall of more than 12 inches fell over a period of 24 hours resulting to a total damage estimated at 13.5 billion pesos. 
Sampling was conducted once a year from 2005 to, 2000, or to 2011, or a period of seven years in the Kalaparan Sibras area within August to October, the months coinciding with the Southwest monsoon. The Nagisa sampling protocol was used. Nagisa uh, literally means in Japanese, in Japanese it means near shore, but Nagisa also stands for natural geography of inshore areas. So Nagisa is a global program that contributes to the Census of Marine Life or COMEL, which aims to monitor long-term biodiversity all over the world. So following Nagisa protocol sampling, we sampled, we laid two 50 meter transects at low intertidal and subtidal, each with five sampling points and were that were 10 meter apart each other. In each sampling point, percent seagrass cover was taken within a one square meter quadrant. To sample the macrofauna, a quarter with a diameter of 15 centimeters and, a mesh, uh, and an air equivalent area of 176.6 square centimeters was pushed to a sediment depth of 10 cm. Sediment was sieved in a 500 micrometer mesh suitable for the macrobenthos. Samples were preserved in 10% buffered formalin solution with rose bengal dye, which allows discrimination between alive and dead macrofauna during the sampling. Retained organisms were sorted, counted, and identified in the lab. Densities were expressed in individuals per square meter. Granulometric analysis was done by sieving the sediment through a series of mesh screens. And sediment type was determined based on the Wentworth gray classification and the median particle size phi. The sorting index, SI, was also computed according to gray 1981. A two-way ANOVA was used to examine temporal differences in macrofaunal densities, while Pearson product moment correlation was used to investigate relationships between seagrass and sediment parameter measurements with the macro and faunal assemblages. So for the results, we start with the macro and faunal composition. It is very obvious that the polychaetes dominated no, at 35% followed by the nematodes, 32%, and the crustaceans, 27%. These three taxa together comprise a total of 94%. So predominant talaga sila. No? The high abundance of nematodes is attributed to their cylindrical body shape that allows them to colonize different habitats. Crustaceans, on the other hand, particularly the tanaids and the harpacticoids, these are epibenthic organisms. They hover just above the substrate and thus are just captured by coders. They are especially abundant in coarser sediments, which render easy mobility. Kingston et al. 1995, on their work in the Brer oil tanker wreck, reported that in general, crustaceans are more sensitive to oil spills compared to the polychaetes and non-nematodes. Okay, I will talk about the polychaete soon, but first uh, uh, in depth, uh, but first the sediment characteristics. Overall sediment type in the area range from medium sand to gravel, so it's coarse sediment, with a five value ranging from minus 2.32 to 2.55 millimeters. Sediment was classified as very well sorted, which is characteristic of coarse sediments. Macrofaunal density, was, however, only weakly correlated with grain size with the R value there of 0.11. Overall mean density or OMD of the macrofauna showed significant differences between the years with an F of 4.2, but not between transects. This suggests that the two transects were not sufficiently apart each from each other 
to show significant differences. Temporal variations in seagrass cover did not also seem to explain the interannual variability of macrofaunal organisms as there was an inverse relationship between macrofaunal density and seagrass cover, as uh, shown here by the R, which is a minus 0 0.02. And finally, the polychaete composition, the most abundant group, the polychaetes, was predominated by two families, family Cilidae, such as Cilis, SP, and family Capitalidae, uh, Mediumastus, SP, for example. Uh, the polychaetes are considered cosmopolitan because of their great capacity to increase in abundance under unfavorable conditions. They are thus labeled as opportunistic organisms. Now, overall mean density of the macrofauna in the Calaparan seagrass beds was 17,750.2 individuals per square meter, which is well within the upper range reported for tropical soft bottom communities. I tried my best here to just show uh, um, soft bottom communities in the tropics. Now, let us look at the interannual or the temporal macro macro infernal abundance. The decrease in mean density in individuals per square meter from September 2005, that is equivalent to 30,823.7 to um, 13,332.2 in August 2006 is considered as the immediate stress response of the macrofauna to the disturbance caused by the oil spill. Reviews of the effects of stress by Rapport et al. Schindler 1987 and Gray 1989 suggested that the universal changes caused by stressors are the following. First, there is a reduction in diversity and abundance. We have seen here the reduction in abundance, the dominance of opportunists, in this case, the silid and the capitalid polychaetes. And third, there is a change in the size structure to small size species. Dovin, 1982, in his study of the Amoco Cadiz oil spill, postulated two distinct phases in the impact of oil spills on benthic communities. The first phase is the so-called short-term destructive stress, occurring selectively in the species level or at the le level of ecological groups and communities. This is usually followed by a proliferation of opportunistic species the polychaetes in this case. Thus, the increase in densities in September 2007 was mainly due to the increase in the species diversity of polychaetes. In addition to the psyllids, a family quest today also, was also observed for the first time. This increase in polychaete diversity is in accordance also with a second phase of oil spill impact, accompanied by the reduction in the density of sensitive crustaceans, crustacean species such as gamarids or the amphipods, tanaids, and was similarly observed in the study of subtidal areas by yours truly and Henito 2010, okay, in the subtidal areas. Enter Typhoon Frank. Okay, the complete decimation in September 2008 was linked to the effect of the physical or the natural disturbance caused by Typhoon Frank. Parallel sampling in the same site uh, and year also showed the absence of the myofauna, as reported by Burgos 2013. The myofauna are the benthic infauna that are retained in a smaller mesh, that's 63 micrometer. The higher degree of mixing during the sorry during the typhoon uh, was due to the high wave action, which could have buried the benthic organisms. It could also have increased the degree of sedimentary suspension and caused water turbidity, which can affect the feeding strategies of the macrofauna and thus decreasing or de decimating in this case their densities. Extreme cases. Uh, as in storms,
Extreme cases as in storms may cause direct physical stress on benthic communities. The very weak inverse relationship that we have seen between seagrass cover and macrobenthic density was contrary to the common assumptions. Now we know, for example, that structural complexity and high food abundance in seagrass veg usually favor animal colonization and diversity. But this is not likely, this is this not happened here because that it is likely due to the fact that the community has already been affected by two major disturbances, both natural and anthropogenic, which have altered the distribution of both seagrass and macrofauna, and macrofauna from their natural trend. Now, compare, further comparing the relative impact of the storm and the oil spill, it was observed that the proliferation of opportunistic polychaetes and nematodes was stronger after the storm than after the oil spill. The more sensitive crustaceans uh, at the same time showed a slower increase after the typhoon than after the oil spill. Furthermore, a well-sorted sediment regime indicates that the benthic organisms here are in general already well adjusted to high water movement with seagrass blades even affording protection to waves. But in spite of this, the much stronger wave energy of the, of the storm obliterated the macrobenthos, thus causing a greater impact than the oil spill. An even more lasting effect of the storm compared to the oil spill is suggested by the lower densities in the years following the storm compared to the year following after, after the oil spill in 2007. The oil spill, on the other hand, although causing immediate stress response, that is uh, as shown by the increase in opportunistic polychaetes, showed a more temporary uh, impact than the typhoon. As we can see higher densities in September 2007 compared to October 2010 and August 2011. Okay, to summarize and to conclude, results of this study showed that interannual variability of macrobenthic organisms in the Kalaparan seagrass bed was driven by factors other than its habitat characteristics, such as sediment granulometry and seagrass cover. Instead, the community was affected, was affected more by the anthropogenic oil spill and unnatural or the typhoon disturbances with the typhoon showing a greater impact. Aside from the disappearance of organisms after the storm, further support of the storm's stronger impact is provided by the stronger recolonization of opportunistic polychaetes after the storm than after the oil spill, with a parallel slower return in the sensitive taxa such as gamarid amphipods. The recolonization events, however, suggest that recovery has gradually taken place after the disturbances. And uh, we assume that they are now recovering. We actually have data uh, much longer after the, the, what this paper covers. This paper is not new. If you want to read more about it, you can, you can check it out in the 2015 issue of the Philippine Agricultural Scientist. Um, this work was funded by the projects of the Ocean Bio Lab, facilitated by Dr. Wilfredo Campos with additional funds from the Oil Spill Response Program or OSRP of UP Visayas, the research assistance of the Marine Bio and the Ocean Bio Lab, plus a number of volunteers provided sampling assistance over the sampling period of seven years. And to all of you, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Bell. Galing naman ng papel. I was about to ask uh, Kanina that were you able to were you able to get the funds to continue the long-term monitoring? And then you mentioned that all in the acknowledgement. <laughs> oh. Yeah, from other oh. sources. 
Yeah, kasi yung normally the problem is ano yung ma, uh, may magandang tingnan but you know, we really need funds to be able to monitor activities like that. Yes. But before I will ask further, uh, from the participant uh, from the from the listeners, from our audience, do you have some questions to ask for uh, Mambel? Most of the part, uh, here Bell, I'm our students. So, kaya timely timing yung, yung presentation. Sige na, tanong na kayo. Dr. Camacho, I think, raised her hand. Ah, uh, yes, please. Hi, Sir Ting, Sir June. Good morning. Morning, Pa. Uh, can you hear me, Pa? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, hi, hi ma'am. Ma'am, ang yes. question ko lang po, uh, in this type of study, it's really difficult to uh, establish yung cost-effect relationship. Say, for instance, uh, were you really able to uh, definitely uh, well, establish that an increase in the oil concentration has led to uh, the changes you, know, you observed in the macrophonal assembly. Uh, you are... You, um, okay. Kasi yung, OS, uh, yung uh, oil spill response ng UP Visayas no, was uh, divided among different groups. And we have we had uh, a group uh, just doing the chemistry of the of the oil spill of the water and the sediment. Uh, so I have not integrated the results here, okay? Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, we cannot point to any other reason uh, for the decrease of the uh, sed uh, of the macrobentals during that year. Uh, remember the, uh, the oil spill happened in August, we sampled also in August. So there can be no other reason uh, except the oil spill for the decrease in the abundance of organisms. Ay, yes, ma'am. Sorry po. Follow up po ulit. Kasi I'm quite interested with the data. So yeah. prior to oil spill, ma'am, meron na po ba tayong baseline data yeah. on the yes. sa area? Yes. I showed, I showed the figure. Control station. Yes, I, think I, I showed the figure. We were okay. able, we started sampling a year before the, a year or two years before the, yes, before the oil spill. So, na-establish na natin yung baseline. In fact, we are so proud of ourselves kasi sa lahat ng groups na nag-study ng oil spill dyan, sa Gimaras kami lang ang may baseline data. Uh, uh, okay. So, we, we had something to compare <laughs> the data with. Okay, ma'am. Thank you very much po, ma'am. Thank you po for answering uh, the question. So, more questions from the Audience? Okay, will na lang daw nila tanungin. <laughs> Ma'am, ma sorry, may isa pa po. Sorry, makulit. Sige, so Ma'am Bibian, go. Oh, wala nagtatanong sa rating eh. Hindi, I'm, I'm just interested in the gastropod community dun po sa area sa seagrass. And I've noticed that uh, you were not able to observe this group, yung mga mollus po. Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if uh, you have observed, because I know for the for the yung solu yung dye po ang dinaday mm -hmm. lang um mm -hmm. ano lang mam de ba mga soft bodied lang po like mga yeah. worms and yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Si so, but if yeah. we had but if we had any mollusks there they would surely be there because they have a shell, de ba? Opo mam. Okay. Pero mam wala po wala wala. Po. wala. Oh, oh, so they're mostly polychaetes, nematodes, and um, uh, the crustaceans. Okay, po, ma'am. Thank you, po. And that has always been the case in our macrobenthic studies, no? not only in Tinmar, even in Malalison Island, uh, or in Banate Bay, or in wherever we have sampled. Uh, ganun talaga, konting konti yung uh, mollusks in our, uh, in our samples. I iba po kasi ma'am sa ibang site sa Philippines, mostly gastropods kasi ah, really? ang associated sa Greece, seagrass po, like say for instance sa Quezon po. Ah, <laughs> I will sample there soon. Okay. <laughs> Pag na-approve yung DOST proposal namin. Okay. <laughs> we thank have you, a sample in Quezon. Apo, thank you po. Thank you. Thank you very, very, uh, 
Thank you very much, Bell. So any more questions from my students here? Maya in sila, Bell. Oh, uh, but uh, actually what you have shown, Bell, is ano talaga, ben, the importance of having this baseline information. Talaga. So mm. kasi, yun na nga, you really don't know ano yung impact kung wala kang mm -hmm. compare before. Mm -hmm. So hindi mangyayari yung before and after. It is, it is quite hard though to get funding for these kinds of uh, studies. Yeah. So ito ginagawa namin using just our... Uh, ano yan, floating funds ang tawag namin. Huh? Okay. And of course, we don't pay the people who who who, who help us sample. Now they are all volunteers. Hinihila lang namin yung mga RAs namin from other projects. Uh, okay. Let's just pay for the travel and for the food. Yeah. And once so, again, it's not too bad. <laughs> the the work <laughs> after the the something is the what's what's bad because it's all microscope work. Oh, yeah, that's really bad. The work oh, starts when you go to the field. Okay? Hindi ka gaya no. In our case here in UP Mindanao, I involve my students in my project. So, sila yung gumagawa ng inter-invertebrate study sa aking ano. Yung fish yung ginagawa ko. So, sinisama ko sila, then doon sila sa shore, and then they're doing their inventory of the invertebrates. Kasi meron din ako mga RAs, uh, listening gear, si Mabel Fortaleza na very interested in invertebrates. So siya yung matyagang nag id na amin mga invertebrates. Mm -hmm. Sige, Now, Bell. Thank you very much, Bell. Yeah. Thank uh, you also uh, for writing um, me. Can, can I, ah, may tanong ka na si Willie. Hmm. Can I just make a comment on the, uh, the, uh, the um, absence of gastropods in the samples? Uh, the study uh, that was done in Takwang was really focused on the in in fauna, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that the uh, the core samples were covered a very very small area. So your probability na makakuha ka ng mga gastropods uh, that are epifaunal or even uh, just below the surface, uh, very low, no? Kasi maliit lang yung ano eh, uh, yung yung diameter ng ng core, no? So. Uh, if you, if uh, the study wanted to look at epifauna or look at the gastropods, then maybe hindi siguro appropriate yung, yung, yung core samples siguro. Ano, iba dapat ang gamitin. No? That, that's why, that's why um, in many of the, the uh, benthic studies uh, like this, no, that use core sampling, halos wala kang makita mga, no, mga, mga mollusks no, in, their, in their data. Because ang focus talaga is in, in fauna, mm -hmm. uh, smaller mm -hmm. ones. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Will. So, any more questions? Uh, if there's none, then uh, we can proceed. Thank you very much, Bell. Thank now you. we'll proceed with the next uh, presenter. So, Dr. Willie El Campos, as you know, uh, she's yung husband ni Ma'am Bell. And like I have known... <laughs> campus boy. Campus <laughs> campus girl. <laughs> Uh, yung all lang ay spelling hindi you. <laughs> so, Tailo ilo you. Are you? <laughs> okay. So, I've known uh, Dr. Willie Campos for quite some time. It's the same with Amabel. Uh, yun, nakita din kami sa Bulina way back 1987. So, Willie also a graduate of uh, UP Diliman uh, for his undergraduate. And then he took up his master's at the uh, Rosenschild School of Marine Science in Miami. And then after that, he went back to the Philippines to do some works. So that's why I met him in Bolinao. And then after that, uh, so obviously the love story of the two nangyari sa Bolinao. <laughs> Ah, siyempre, para manaman nila yung love story niyo yung dalawa. <laughs> and then after that, so, umalis sila. And then, uh, si, Dr., uh, si Willie also uh, proceed to Germany uh, para for his uh, PhD. So then, pagbalik nila na PhD na sila, they uh, settled in UPB. So, with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Willie Campos. Will, you can share your uh, na, na, slide. Okay, thank you, Ting, for a very uh, nice introduction. <laughs> uh, let me just uh, share.
Um, okay na siya? Palabas na? Okay. Let me just... Bill, pwede mo palakihan? Oo. Ano ko lang itong... Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, okay na ito? Yeah. Okay na ito? Yeah, okay. yeah, thank you. So, um, uh, I'd like to talk about the distribution of Sardinella Limuro and the dynamics of productivity in Intikao Pass. Um, this is based on studies that we uh, did in 2016 and just recently finished uh, um, in April this year. Um, <clears throat> sardine fisheries uh, represent about 15% of uh, the total capture fisheries in the country. Uh, so that one out of every six kilograms of fish that are caught in our seas is, uh, consists of sardines. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the sardine fisheries are most productive in areas where you find upwelling. So here is a uh, figure I borrowed from uh, Dr. Villanueva's paper showing um, uh, cooler temperatures, the light blue colors you know, of um, the west side of the Bicol Peninsula. You know? Uh, in the uh, Bohol Sea you know, and just off the coast of uh, the Sumbuanga Peninsula. No? These are also the more um, uh, uh, productive uh, sardine fishing grounds. No? Um, I'll be talking about Sardinella Limuro. This is the Bali sardine. It has it had been misidentified as um, <clears throat> the Indian oil sardine or Sardinella longiceps for a long time, but uh, for almost 10 years now, the uh, this has been clarified that uh, uh, the species we're talking about is actually the Bali sardine. It's the most abundant species in, our, in the national sardine fisheries. No? Uh, they're abundant uh, in um, here uh, of Bicol. These are the major fishing grounds of sardines in the country. So uh, Sardine Lermur is abundant in this area here and uh, more abundant uh, here of Sambuanga Peninsula, um, uh, moderately abundant in uh, Northern Mindanao and uh, in Sulu Archipelago also abundant. So I'll be talking about the fishery for sardines in the area along Tikau Pass and the San Bernardino area. Okay, um, uh, the study that um, we just recently finished was uh, on the sardine fisheries biology and uh, reproduction in um, this area, which is now called the fisheries management area seven, which actually includes Samar Sea. Uh, the San Bernardino Strait area in Tikau and Burias Pass, all the way to Ragaigao. Okay. Um, <clears throat> these are this is the uh, FMA seven showing the grid. We use the grid to uh, identify where the uh, uh, fishing operations took place, and these were our sample sites, sampling and monitoring sites in um, in um, Bicol, Balatan. Cabarina Sur, Piaduran in Albay, Bulan in Sorsogon, and um, Monreal in uh, part of Masbate. No? So we uh, monitored catch and effort of the fishery um, in six sites in Bicol, uh, four sites in Bicol, and uh, uh, three sites actually in, uh, in, in uh, southern in, in Samar Sea. No? Um, uh, we initially had more sites, but uh, we had to give them up because we could not visit the sites and uh, get the samples and get the monitoring going because of the pandemic. No? But somehow we were able to manage in, in uh, these three sites in Beacon and these three sites in Samar. And uh, fishing effort uh, was monitored daily. Uh, the number of boats going out uh, and, and the catches were recorded daily in these sites. No? Uh, we also installed uh, GPS uh, tracking uh, units uh, to uh, vessels of our uh, collaborators, uh, a few of them. Uh, I, I believe there were two or three vessels in uh, Bulan, which is the main fleet, sardine fleet. And then um, um, one unit in Monreal, which broke down. And then another one or two units in, uh, in the summer sea. Um, Catches were subsampled and sardines were measured twice, once or twice a week uh, for the uh, study period. And then samples were purchased um, and uh, fixed and then sent to the lab in, uh, uh, in Iloilo. Um, uh, samples were taken once a week. Now, so we, we did this work in partnership with Bicol University, Tobacco Campus, to take care of the Bicol 
side of uh, the work and then with Summer State University uh, to take care of the, the summer seed part of the work. Um, and for the biology, um, uh, the samples that were collected weekly were of course measured, the gonad uh, stages were determined and uh, using the gonad weight, the gonad somatic index was, was used uh, to look at the seasonality, to determine the seasonality of maturation and the other studies as well. So in this study, in this presentation, I, I just want to, to uh, characterize the distribution of the stock or what appears to be the distri distribution of the stock in relation to what we believe is the, um, how the productivity, what drives the productivity in the area. Uh, so find out later, marami pa kami talagang questions. No? Um, anyway, uh, we'll look at the Northern part of the uh, uh, study area first. And this um, is uh, San Bernardino Strait. This is the Pacific, uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, here are the, the sites of the study. This is Tikau Island. So this place is Tikau Pass. This is Burias Island, Burias Pass, Ragai Gulf. No? <clears throat> so we look at this area first, the Northern part. No? Um, the estimated annual catch in uh, 2020, our estimates was about 60,000 metric tons. No? Unfortunately, there's no really uh, available information to which we can valid validate this or verify this amount. No? But part of the study was really to provide an estimate of annual catch. No? Um, and, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the capacity of the, the fleet no, uh, based in Bulan um, is uh, much higher than the, 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 the vessels that you find in the other sites. No? Okay, um, here in the northern part of the, the study area, the vessel capacities are uh, about half the vessel capacities that you find in the southern, in, in, in this part, in Bulan, in, uh, in Monreal, because this is the main fishing area here. Uh, at certain times of the year. Um, but the fleet in Bulan actually uh, are much larger vessels that can, are more seaworthy as well. No? Okay, I'll show you uh, that in a, in a few minutes. No? So this is uh, showing catch rates uh, of um, uh, vessels from Balatan here, uh, way up there. No? Okay, and then in Piuduran here, Okay, and then in Tikau Island here. Okay, so geographically uh, in sequence. And we can see that um, they have a common, uh, they show a common result of having low, very, very low catch rates uh, from the months of uh, July to uh, 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 June to October, I'm sorry, you know, June to October. You know? uh, and uh, we could discontinue sampling here because uh, it was very difficult to travel to that site, but um, in the remainder of the sites, this is uh, November, September. Um, the uh, blue bars refer to total catches, uh, and the yellow bars refer to um, the catches of sardines. So in, in, in these fisheries in the northern part, most of their catches are sardines, you know? uh, although some of them do shift. You know? um, so that um, common in, in this area is that uh, from June to October, there's a decrease in the, uh, in the um, <clears throat> uh, catch rates no? uh, in, in these areas, not to almost nil, no? okay? Very different when you look at um, Pulan, no? okay? Here is the bigger fleet, no? We see that for those months from uh, June, July to, to October, we find that there are still moderate uh, catch rates and perhaps for the rest of the year. We did not start our monitoring here in Bulan until this part. No? So, um, and um, well, if you're wondering, we were wondering why in, in Monreal, which is just across from Bulan, it's very different uh, seasonality in the catch rates. No? But um, if we look at the, <clears throat> the GPS track um, uh, vessel operations no? in Bulan, this is just in Bulan, no? we see that um, uh, in early March, April and May, uh, fishing uh, uh, operations were concentrated here. There are less, um, uh, less marks. The polygons here refer to the areas where uh, fishing operations, daily fishing operations took place. No? Um, because again, because of the pandemic, uh, we had uh, uh, less than what we targeted, no? uh, less number of days no? uh, because of that. But uh, uh, there were um, uh, 
most of the operations were here in these areas. No? And then um, we don't have any information from June, July, um, again, because of the pandemic. But in October, we see that uh, the operation shifted further south, no? up to this area here. No? Okay, from this area, they shifted further south. And as we'll see later, no? um, well, here, uh, just around the time that you find very, very low catch rates around this area here, no? uh, the catch rates of Bulan uh, actually do not really change that much because they're moving actually up to the southern portion, no? okay? following the stock. No? Okay, so that there seems to be uh, dispersion of your, um, uh, of your stock towards the north uh, during the summer months no? uh, and um, towards the uh, southwest monsoon months, no? the dispersion uh, is towards the south. No? We, we'll look at that later on. No? Okay, so um, if we, from October onwards, October, from November, no? right after October no? in December, no, the fleet moves back uh, towards uh, Bulan, towards Tikau Pass, no? and then January to March, uh, January to February, they move further northwards, no? and then March going back again to this area. No? So again, we have uh, the fishery of Bulan, no? because the fleets can move much farther than the others. No? Uh, they sort of move right after spawn, right after the main season of October, November, or November, December, you know, they move uh, northwards and then southwards and then back here uh, within the year. You know? And we believe, we believe that they seem to follow the stock. And we'll look at other um, characteristics of the, uh, of, the, of the catches that are in support of this. You know? Okay, uh, this is maturity uh, of um, uh, catches in uh, the northern part of. Uh, uh, the fishing area. So we have uh, uh, our females uh, on the left and males on the right. The stock bars refer to uh, maturity stages of their gonads. We just want to look at the yellow portions. The yellow portions refer to mature and the blue portions to, to immature portions. No? So we see that um, for uh, in, 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 um, in, uh, uh, in most cases, no? in all three sites, no? we find that the highest uh, proportions of mature fish are around the Northeast monsoon months, no? November, December, no? okay? With uh, somewhat October here for Monreal, but mostly November, December in all, okay? In these three sites. In addition to that, here in Monreal, there seems to be high uh, mature, mature or high proportions of mature fish also, and probably some spawning also in July, August, no? For males and females here in this area. No? We don't have any data for that period of time for Bulan and nor do we have data for, for, for Pio Duran. No? But um, likely there, there uh, uh, is going to be some spawning at least in this area during these months, but not in uh, the same magnitude or similar magnitude as what you find in November, December. Okay, and um, the... Uh, uh, the, the gonad somatic index no? uh, for male, both males and females uh, is very consistent with uh, what the uh, gonad maturity stages uh, show. No? There's very little difference between males and females. Uh, and very clearly the peak spawning period is November and December, at least for this species. And uh, going back to, uh, to uh, the fishing locations, no? uh, fishing is uh, concentrated here during these months. So we believe that there is a spawning aggregation um, of sardines uh, uh, in this area during those months. No? Uh, it doesn't mean that there are no sardines other in, uh, in other places. There are, no? but uh, there is an aggregation in this area no? uh, in October, November, where there is massive spawning. No? And then after that, there is dispersion. No? Uh, there's still sardines, but their densities are much, much lower because of the dispersion. No? Okay, there's also some spawning uh, north of, uh, I'll call this the Tikau San Bernardino area. No? Uh, there's also some spawning in July and August here in this area. Okay. Now let's look at the southern portion of the uh, in summer sea. No? And here I'm highlighting the Tikau San Bernardino area because this seems to be the uh, center of spawning no? um, uh, as a reference point. No? 
Okay, let's look at the catch rates first. No? Okay, uh, Kawayan up here in the top. So Kawayan is here. Okay, this is Samar C. Uh, the blue says it's uh, it's uh, less than 200 meters in, in depth. So this is really very deep. No? The channel itself, the, the strait itself is also less than 200 meters. No? Uh, but more importantly, Kawayan's, Kawayan is located at the mouth of Samar C. No? And then the other stations, Daram is uh, uh, in the inner portion of Summer Sea, but quite in the center. You know? So it's still surrounded by, uh, by, by deep water. It's far from the mainland coast, you know? uh, whereas Tarangnan uh, is on, on the coast of Samar. You know? So there's a gradient in terms of um, um, location, uh, in terms of uh, uh, location within the bay. You know? Okay. So that if we look at the, uh, the catch rates no, here, well, the fishing areas for both uh, Taram and Tarangnan, even for Kawayan, are, are just in the immediate area, no, within one or two kilometers from the bay. So, so very, very, um, uh, very uh, confined. No? Okay. So if you look at the catch rates, no, starting from Kawayan at the mouth of, of, uh, of uh, Summer Sea, no, we see that uh, there is a decrease in August, no, and uh, it remains uh, uh, low uh, until about September uh, and October, and then it increases again in November and December. No, similar to what you uh, what we observe here in the northern part of the uh, of the fishing area. No, okay, uh, it's quite different here in in Daram in Tarangnan in the inner portion of uh, of Sao Marci. Uh, in in Daram. Uh, which is in the central portion, but inner part of it, we also find a decrease. Again, um, the blue bars here are for total catch and the orange bars are for sardines. No? So um, in, in Sao Marci, um, uh, the same gear catches other small pelagics aside from sardines. No? But if you just focus on the orange bars in Daram, we do have uh, moderate catch rates uh, during the summer into the early Southwest monsoon, and then also a decrease in July uh, for the rest of the year, no, here. No? Uh, in the same also for Tarangnan, no? uh, we don't, we find very little sardine catches um, from July onwards the rest of the year, okay? So in other words, uh, close, uh, in, uh, in, in the region of the mouth of Summer Sea, we have uh, catch rates showing the same seasonality as the Northern part. No? So if we look at the maturity and spawning of, uh, of the same species, no, we find that um, uh, at least for uh, in, in Kawayan, close to uh, uh, the mouth of Summer Sea, uh, we find the uh, uh, mature, a proportion of mature uh, fish, similar to also what you find in the uh, Northern part of the study area. No? But in Daram here, no, we find um, uh, that there is spawning uh, in June, in August and September, but we don't find any more Sardinella remuro after September. So Sardinella remuro are, are, are lost from the catches uh, here in Daram. In Tarangnan, there are no Sardinella remuro. It's a different species. No? Okay, so that um, um, uh, we believe that uh, around September and October, the Sardinella, the Bali sardines start leaving Daram and start probably moving out from the inner portion of summer sea. No? Okay, I'll get back to that later. Okay, we'll look at Tarangnan. I mentioned that uh, here very close to the coast, there is no Sardinera limuru. What we find is a different species, no? uh, the fimbriated sardines, Sardinera fimbriata in Tarangnan. In Daram, you find Sardinella uh, fimbriata, which start appearing around June, July. No? And they make up the catches of sardines around uh, August, September, October, November, around the time when your Sardinella remuro leaves the, leaves the area. You know? So they start dominating the catches uh, there. You know? And um, some, uh, the disfimbriated sardine also mature during October, November. Okay. So uh, this information tells us that uh, for the fimbriated sardine, uh, we find them only in the shallower portions, inner part of the summer sea. You know? Um, uh, they uh, are there are no other sardine species in the innermost portion, and there's a mix of uh, Bali and fimbriated sardine here in the central portion. Uh, in Kawayan, there are no fimbriated sardines. 
Okay? The Bali sardine, which is the dominant sardine in the entire uh, study area, is more frequently found here. No, there are no fimbriated sardine here. And the dynamics of your catches here and even your maturity is very close to what you find in the northern uh, part of the uh, study area. Okay, so uh, let's look at the size distributions. No? Uh, the yellow, these are the size distributions. We have sizes here and the, the percentage. Uh, and uh, the yellow uh, rectangles just represent the size range from the smallest to the modal size in Bulan, in, in this of catches here in the reference point. No? Okay, so these are the size distributions of catches here in the northern part, here in, in, in Balatan, in Monreal, and this one here is in Bulan. And this one is in Summer Sea. No? And very clearly, no, we can see that um, there are larger fish, no? larger fish. Uh, these are arranged in quarters, January to March, April to June, June Gen, uh, July to September, October to November. No? We, can, we find larger fish in the northern part of the, uh, of the fishing area, whereas in the southern part in summer, you find uh, very, very few large ones. So there's mostly smaller ones. No? And as you go from the outer portion of summer sea, no, in, 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 in Kawayan, towards the inner portion in Daram, you have an increasing, progressively increasing portion of juvenile fish. No? Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, we believe that this is uh, the, size, the, the distribution of the sizes with respect to the northern and the southern part of the fishing ground no? has to do with uh, the dispersal of juveniles from uh, this area, no, okay, uh, especially during the southwest monsoon uh, from June and July, they move, they seem to appear to move well into the summer sea, no, uh, as juveniles, that's why you have smaller fish, no, okay, whereas in the uh, northern uh, part, you do have right after spawning here in this November and December, there's dispersal northwards, no, uh, and they, a portion of that remains there. Some of them probably uh, move southwards no? uh, uh, as juveniles and um, uh, develop here in the summer sea. And they probably move back. No? Okay? That's what uh, uh, these data are telling us. No? Okay? So if you look at the uh, chlorophyll A concentrations no? uh, for March to May, uh, October to December and January to February, we see that um, uh, the high concentrations are the white, yellow, and red. We find that in November, December, and January, we have concentrations of high chlorophyll concentrations close to the coast of Bicol, but um, uh, well, only here in the uh, Tikau San Bernardino area um, in January. You know? okay. If you look at temperature, the lighter color is the colder temperature. We find that in December and January, you find in, in, in relation to its surroundings, no, uh, a bit cooler water uh, here in the Tikau Pass, uh, San Bernardino area, which is indicative of water that's been up, uh, coming from subsurface uh, uh, layers, no, um, uh, being uh, forced towards the surface, no, uh, being upwell towards the surface. No. Okay. Um, again, this is strongest during the Northeast monsoon, no? um, uh, and uh, not too uh, recognizable the rest of the year. No? We tried to look at the same type of information in summer sea, and we could not find um, could not find any any pattern no? between um, between the different seasons. So there we might need to look at other factors, no? or uh, other um, uh, at a finer level. No? Okay, so what drives upwelling in San Bernardino Strait? The study was done in 2011. Uh, this shows the topography, bottom topography of, uh, this is the southern part of Sorsagon. This is San Bernardino Strait. These are the islands, no? couple island. There is a sill here, shallow sill, which is about 80 meters. And then another sill, which is a little deeper. The, surf, the top portion of that's a little, a little deeper than this one here. No? So as water passes, uh, at flood tide no, from the Pacific, no, um, 
uh, that water mass uh, is uh, uh, going to be modified. Its path, its flow is going to modify, going to be modified by uh, the sill in this portion. No? So that this is the sill in a cross section, and we see uh, water coming in uh, here in this direction here. No? Okay, incoming water from the tide, no, and uh, deeper water here uh, when it uh, flows outward, no. Okay. Uh, uh, hits the sill and uh, has to move forward. And as the tide comes in you know, uh, from the Pacific, you know, this uh, subsurface layer is entrained towards the surface and brought uh, further northwestward you know, up along the coast of Bicol. You know? Okay, that's what we think is what is happening. And this is uh, what, the reason why there are high chlorophyll concentrations along Bicol coast from Bulan all the way up to Rio Duran. Okay, as again shown here. Okay, this is what happens in the northeast monsoon. We don't really know what happens in the rest of the year. Um, we don't know how strong or if there is any upwelling. Uh, I guess there might be upwelling here, but we don't know how strong uh, that is. No, during the summer and the rest of the year, we don't know the mechanism of uh, transporting that enriched water further north towards Pilar and maybe um, uh, Don Sol area, all the way up to Piodoran, where you have, during the summer, you have your uh, zooplankton aggregations being fed upon by your, um, uh, by your Butanding no? uh, aggregations. No? Um, we also don't know what happens in the summer sea during the rest of the year, what conditions are favorable for them, uh, such that uh, there seems to be a uh, movement of juveniles uh, towards the uh, summer sea during the uh, late summer and early southwest monsoon. We don't know those. Huh? Those are questions that uh, we have no answers to. No? So just to summarize, no? okay. Sp there's a spawning aggregation that is timed with uh, strong upwelling and enriched productivity here in this area between, uh, in, between Tikau and San Bernardino Pass. No? Okay. Uh, in uh, January to February, the fleet moves, extends towards the north uh, in pursuit, probably following the stock. But we also believe that there is dispersal of the stock, including the juveniles, uh, towards the north in January and February, uh, towards probably Ragai Gulf here, further west towards Tayabas Bay, and towards the Cebuian Sea. No? Okay. The juveniles are dispersed in this area where they develop and mature. There is also some spawning that we've seen no, um, in this area in July and August, definitely not the same magnitude as the spawning here. No. Okay. Uh, and uh, from June or July uh, onwards, there seems to be uh, the fleet moves towards the south. No. Okay. And uh, there seems to be a dispersal of the stock. Uh, primarily the jubilars towards the south into summer sea, you know, okay, where they develop, okay, uh, and also dispersal into the East Visayan Sea. You know? So here in the East Visayan Sea, we're not so sure if uh, they move, continue into Tanyan in Kamote Sea here or Tanyan Street as well, but we do find the Bali Sardine in Tanyan Strait. You know? um, we also do find in the northeast coast of Panay, we find west uh, juveniles of uh, the Bali sardine around January to, to March, even April. No? Uh, and they, they could be coming from this migration as well because we don't find any Bali sardine in the Cebuian Sea. No? Okay. But again, we, we, we don't have any tracer to, to, to do that. No? Okay, so going back to Samar Sea, no? Uh, when the juveniles enter in the, um, uh, in the southwest monsoon, they, they mature here, and then some actually uh, spawn. No? Okay, and by September, no, they uh, uh, start moving back. No, they appear to be start moving back, uh, so that by by uh, October November, uh, they are back in the Tikau San Bernardino area to spawn again. No? So we don't know if uh, the juveniles that are dispersed here or the adults. Uh, that are dispersed here at that time around October, November, also uh, move towards the south to aggregate here. We don't know that. That's just an hypothesis. No? 
Okay, so that's how we, 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 we see the distribution of Sardinella de Moor in relation to what we know for now of the productivity dynamics in the area. Okay, thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Will. So, any questions from the audience? Anyone? So, Will, with your presentation, solo malabas na mas difficult to manage ang sardines? Uh, at least in this area, I don't think we find the same, the extent of, if you want, I would really, I'm not really sure if their movement, it's more of dispersal. No? They aggregate and then they disperse. No? Yes. Um, we don't see, we have not seen anything close to that no? in Sambuanga, for example, no? or even in the Visayan Sea. No? So, dito mapapansin talaga to, even the the fishermen, uh, uh, fishermen uh, tell you about this, no? that they move. No? Um, the stock moves. No? So, it's probably because the, the topography, no? the it's a very uh, very narrow area and very strong currents. And then uh, the mixing of water from the Pacific, uh, the bottom topography in that area causes uh, upwelling. And uh, because it's uh, very dependent on the Northeast monsoon wind systems of water being pushed into the San Bernardino Strait, um, when that Northeast monsoon um, uh, weakens no, towards the summer, uh, maybe the, the dynamics also uh, slacken a bit, no? So hindi ganon ko concentrated in in in, uh, in spatially in a spatial sense in the other fishing grounds, no? So uh, in the way in a, in a way yes, major mahirap i manage, major mahirap aralin because um, you have to monitor both summer yeah. sea and ano, no? At the same and, time. And the call, no? Uh, and that's what we tried to do, you know, because our, our previous studies suggested that that is the way they move. You know? So, mahirap, But um, one of the repercussions of this is if you concentrate on your, your data collection only you know, for, for stock assessment in the Bicol region, you know, makikita may effect ng migration, nawawala yung mga malalaki. Yeah. Nawawala talaga yung malalaki. So, all your parameters, your estimates for population parameters are going to be blown off. No? No? But of course, this the movement and the dynamics, I think, also differ from year to year. No? Might be dependent also the productivity dynamics. It's a very interesting place to look at. No? Hmm. Yeah. Pero ang maturity nila within the year, for example, if yes. uh, so gonna Yes, um, we don't know what's driving it, but I think it's it's common in in, in, in tropical waters, no? That uh Merem Peak, no, uh my uh, months talaga na talaga matakas ang proportion is spawn, but there's always a portion, uh a uh, smaller portion of the uh, of the of the stock that uh, is mature uh for for several months during the year. No? So protracted over several months. No? I think that's that's not uncommon, no? uh, but it could be uh, exacerbated if the stock is under under very heavy pressure. fishing pressure. Yes. No? So I'm not saying that um, the the stock here in uh, in um, in uh, the study area is uh, overexploited already. No, uh, but we're also looking into the age of the fish when they start. Uh, when they start uh, uh, maturing no? um, in uh, in the in the area. So, so because, you're looking at right now the age relationship with their maturity. Uh, yes, we've uh, we have initial results on that. Um, they they seem to mature in between three to five months. No, uh, so that, that fast. We, yes, yes, that fast. We, the mature fish that we examined in December of 2016. Uh, some of them as early as just over three months, no? uh, up to about uh, just over five months. No? Uh, but of course, you know, we need to increase the sample size, uh, probably. No? And um, uh, another thing is uh, uh, we need to, to uh, validate you know, our, our microstructure counts, spring counts, with a more, uh, more accurate scanning electron microscope uh, uh, images. Okay, thank you. Any more questions for Dr. Willy Campos?
Sir Tim, uh, not really a question, but a uh, comment. Yes, go ahead, Sir Jim. Uh, I think it, it. I think the doc, the study of Doctor Willie is very interesting, especially for me that uh, who who is very interested in our tawilis, which is a freshwater sardine. It's believed that uh, the ancestor of tawilis is also a marine species, and therefore the dispersion behavior of a marine uh, sardines will be very useful in understanding the behavior of our uh, uh, only freshwater sardine and probably help in conserving it. So I think we should thank you for that. Thank you also, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Kevin Labrador. Yes, Kevs. Hello, Bob. good morning. So really thank you for the presentation. Sir, uh, I've worked with sardine before, sa sardine 5, under kay Ma'am Dusat na component. I would just like to ask, uh, meron po bang tawag dito uh, entry nung stock na nakikita ninyo sa internal seas towards sa uh, northern Samuanga Peninsula and the northern Mindanao region? And second question would be, paano po nito ma-affect yung dynamics ng population dun sa NZP at NMR? Thank you po. Yes, hi Kevin. Good question. Very, very good question. Uh, I don't think I can answer that. But if you look at no, the sizes of the catches in, uh, in uh, the, um, the area where we, uh, in Bicol area and Summer Sea area, no, um, they're, they're larger, actually. No? They're larger than uh, what we've seen in, in Sambuanga. No? Uh, if you look at their reproductive uh, dynamics, no, uh, they, they mature to larger size as well. Uh, than in, in Samuanga. Uh, we have not really compared their ages yet no, because it might be a, a, a function of the food no, uh, where um, those, uh, those that are growing faster attain a larger size but at the same age no, as those of Samuanga. No? Uh, but um, the fecundity also is a function of size. No? Uh, but there are uh, there is information uh, as far as the reproduction, reproductive capacity, and also the size distributions that tell us that uh, they're not completely linked together. No, uh, if there is some uh, linking, I'm not saying they're isolated. No, uh, genetically, of course, they're not. No, but um, um, uh, if they contribute to that stock, it, it doesn't look like there's going to be substantial. Uh, contribution to that stock, no? uh, from uh, from uh, the Bicol area to to um, to Samuanga, no? uh, but of course um, the, the, I cannot be more definitive than that. Um, in other words, there, there there has to be more evidence to really say that uh, def more definitively. That's what I mean. No? Um, uh, well, the other question was. Uh, how is that going to affect? Uh, yeah, I, I think na cover na po din sa okay, first yes. ano natin yung ano. So, okay. Thank you very much, Sir Willie. Po. Okay. okay. Thank you, Kevin. Yes. It's fine. Okay. Thank you very much. Any more questions? Ipo lang naman po. Prami, uh, prami, salamat. Uh, Will. Okay. Thank you very much. And then uh, we'll proceed to the third speaker. So, so Sir Jun will introduce the third speaker. So go ahead, Sir Jun. Thank you, Sir Ting. Uh, our next speaker uh, is a is an atmospheric scientist from the from UP Diliman College of Science Institute of Environmental Science and Meteorology. So from two topics from uh, co uh, focusing on marine. Uh, he's sort of going to lead us to fly because the uh, topic is about transport of air, air pollutants from East and Southeast Asia to Northern Philippines. So our next speaker uh, obtained his PhD from Chiba University on atmospheric physics and atmospheric remote sensing. And uh, previous to that, he had his BS and MS in physics from De La Salle University in Manila. And he's very well known for developing and he's currently running what we call Weather Manila. And many of us have uh, subscribed to that or used that uh, app for, for, for local weather or local uh, forecast. 
So without much ado, let's welcome Dr. Jerry Bagtasa. Thank you, Sir John. Uh, so like nabanggit ni Sir John, uh, this topic will be a little bit different from the previous speakers. Um, so anyway, I, I hope that uh, interesting this idea. So this is about the transport of air pollutants from East and Southeast Asia to Northern Philippines. Um, so let me show you global emissions. Uh, this is from 2018, global emissions of carbon dioxide. As you can see, there are several regions with very high emissions, particularly in East Asia, uh, India, the European Union, and the US. Uh, but uh, around 15 years ago, um, East Asia, particularly China, actually uh, surpassed the emissions of US and the European Union already. Uh, this is from anthropogenic emissions. On the other hand, we also have a lot of emissions to our south in Southeast Asia. There's a lot of biomass burning that's happening uh, yearly. So in, in short, we are surrounded with a lot of emissions from anthropogenic to biogenic emissions. Um, and then on top of the emissions, we also have a um, very complex weather system in the um, in the Pacific, uh, Pacific Asian region. So we have the monsoon uh, systems, which I, I'm sure everybody's familiar. Uh, we also have typhoons diba, that uh, can affect uh, the movement of the wind, just like in the past few days here in Metro Manila or in, in Luzon. Um, we have yung, um, uh, frontal systems that can remove, in fact, um, pollutants in, in in the atmosphere, so depending on how strong the, how intense the rains are, they can in fact remove or let uh, atmospheric pollutants stay. So on top of, of this um, uh, complex uh, interactions between um, uh, weather systems, we also have you know, biomass burning, uh, anthropogenic emission, and we also have um, dust uh, from uh, the western part of China, uh, Taktamakan and Gobi Desert, that are transported through very complex um, interactions between uh, frontal systems. So, because of, um, so in short, yung air pollution, it's not only a local problem, but uh, it's in fact a global problem already. So, there's what you call the Total Carbon Column Observing Network or TCON. So, it's a uh, Essentially, these are sites that measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And in fact, uh, since 2017, we have one in the northern part of um, the Philippines in Ilocos Norte. So the province is called Burgos, in the pinaka edge, uh, northwestern edge of Luzon. And we have this uh, site that measures some um, carbon dioxide uh, together with all the other sites, mainly in Europe and in the U.S. Um, so this Tikon Burgos site um, is actually brought by, the, the equipment is brought by the National Institute for Environmental Studies in Japan. Um, so it has, it's a 40-foot container, so may dalawang uh, measurements na ginagawa. The half of the container uh, measures carbon dioxide using the Fourier transform spectrometer. And then the other half of the container uh, measures aerosols in the atmosphere. So... Um, whenever there are actually two satellites right now measuring carbon dioxide for the globe, uh, one from NASA and one from JAXA of Japan. So whenever they pass by Burgos, they actually um, adjust their sensors to target the Burgos site because the Burgos site is the one uh, that they try to mimic. So ito kasi yung mas ground truth and the uh, satellites they need to adjust their measurements. So for the tropics, uh, let me go back to the, no, no. so tayo yung nasa tropics kasi uh, apart from uh, Darwin in Australia. So sa tropics, konti yung uh, corrections na ginagawa for satellites and in fact this is a very important site because yun nga, uh, yun sa tropics medyo iba yung, um, yung characteristics of the atmosphere compared to mid-latitude and even yung polar region. So we've been doing this since 2017, again, with uh, Japan. So the FTI are the one measuring the carbon dioxide. Essentially, it looks at the, directly at the sun. And uh, it also looks at the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide. So by comparing the amounts of carbon dioxide and oxygen, their absorption of sunlight, we can actually uh, get a measurement of the column 
a carbon dioxide concentration. And then we use that to correct the measurements of whole of carbon dioxide concentrations gathered from satellite data. And then uh, for the aerosol, we actually um, uh, release laser light into the atmosphere. And then once you have aerosols in the atmosphere, we, we they, they reflect the light and the amount of light and the characteristics of light that they reflect, uh, we can get the properties of the aerosols in the atmosphere. So it, this is still operational. Um, and the plan ng Japan is to make this operational until uh, until kaya ng equipment. So 10, 15, 20 years, uh, it will go on. Um, so nung, uh, a few years ago, uh, we did measurements. So from 2015 to 2017, I did measurements in Burgos de Locos Norte. Apart from the TCON site, I did uh, measurements of uh, particulate matter. And the goal of this measurement is to see if um, pollutants from East Asia, which has the highest ano, emission uh, in the world, can can reach the Philippines. So there's a lot of studies already that they can reach uh, other parts of China and uh, if they can reach Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. But uh, during that time, there, there were no studies on, on whether they can reach the Philippines. So I, I set up some of this equipment to measure PM2.5 and chemical characteristics of PM2.5. Just to show you Yung, ano, so it, it makes use of a filter, so parang vacuum cleaner. It sucks air through the filter and then the filter collects the particulate matter. These are the what I collected in Lo, in Burgos, Ilocos Norte. So after 24 hours, you see that there's a grayish diba, yung filter, which is supposed to be initially white. So it's grayish after 24 hours of collecting samples. Sa UP naman, this is inside UP already, dilemma. <laughs> After 24 hours, same equipment, same everything. Uh, this is uh, what I got. So as you can see, diba, dito sa Metro Manila, it's totally different from um, from other parts of the Philippines. Um, so in this is uh, I'm going to talk about the case for March 9 to 16. So it's a one week uh, measurement period in 2017, wherein there were two high pollutant events. So during the first part of uh, this week-long measurement uh, period, we have high pollutant events in, on the first day, and then it went down uh, for a few days, and then on the final day of measurement, it went up again to around 25 uh, microgram per cubic meter. By the way, you see WHO, uh, ito yung threshold nila, 25 microgram per cubic meter, that's, uh, that's uh, okay. Uh, below it, it's okay, higher than then 25, then that's uh, essentially polluted atmosphere. So considering that um, this is a rural region, very uh, low population, uh, umabot siyang 25. So looking at yung trajectory of the wind, what we saw was um, uh, whenever you have high concentrations in Burgos, uh, you have this type of trajectory. So meaning winds are coming from the northeast of China. Uh, on the other hand, during the during the low concentration days, this is essentially yung wind uh, trajectory. Um, it's coming from the Pacific. So still from from the Korean Peninsula, um, in the Yellow Sea, but uh, there's a there's a ridge here which is climatologically during winter time or during yeah, amihan season, nandito tong, sorry, nandito tong ridge na to. So what we have is a trajectory like this, um, which essentially nag-curve nag siya and it, it traverses the Pacific Ocean. Um, so by looking at the chemical uh, composition, chemical profiles of uh, the PM2.5 concentration, we were able to uh, determine the sources um, of um, this, PM 2.5 in particulate matter. So we identified six sources. We have the sea salt, so it makes sense to say it's a coastal region. Uh, we have fine dust um, and local solid waste burning. So in Pagsisiga uh, is a significant source of pollution in, uh, I'd say, in many rural regions. Pero we also found long-range transport of industrial emission, uh, long-range transport of 
sulfate and long-range transport of solid waste burning. And most of this long-range transport um, comes during the Amihan season, during the winter, which is December, January, and the springtime around March, April. So, dito lumalabas tong mga uh, emissions na to. So, a third of the emission is from, or, or rather, a third of the pollutants in Burgos is from natural sources, sea salt and dust. So, one third. Then, another third is from yung pagsisiganga, solid waste burning. And then, one third comes from long-range transport from um, uh, East Asia. So, these are um, dispersion models that um, I did to see how they are transported into the Philippines. So these are daily snapshots from March 5 to March 8. So the first uh, high concentration um, event, no? and then this is the second high concentration event. So what happens here is that because of the Siberian high in Siberia, it, it gets strong and then it accumulates the uh, pollutants in Northeast Asia. And this, this Siberian high also pushes the wind southward. So while it's accumulating the pollutants in Northeast Asia, Northeast China, it also pushes it southward. So after one day it's here, the second day it's in East China Sea, and then around third and fourth day, uh, it reaches the northern part of the Philippines. So it's the same thing for the latter part of the um, sampling period. Um, and there's another thing. Um, when looking at the model, we also saw that uh, there's actually movement of um, particulates um, aloft, so around three kilometers aloft, uh, so 750 to 700 hectopascal height is around three, two to three kilometers. But uh, there's something else that's uh, coming to the Philippines. And looking at the model, what we saw was that the biomass burning from the Indochina Peninsula. Uh, they are actually being transported eastward. Ah, sorry. Uh, yeah, eastward. Um, uh, aloft, so around two to three kilometers high. So this these emissions here, they are able to move eastward and then eventually reach the northern part of the Philippines. So it's the same thing for the latter part of the sampling period. So umaabot dito. So we wanted. So we we know that things are coming from East Asia, but we also wanted to know kung, kung itong model na to ay totoo ba kung coming from the Indochina Peninsula. So we made use of the LiDAR measurements, which essentially gives us a vertical profile of the, of the pollutants. So the y-axis here is the height kung nasaan yung mga pollutants. The, the higher the, or the more red rather, the color is the higher the essentially yung pollution niya, the aerosol. Hello, Sir Jerry. Nawala ata kayo. Mukhang nawala si Sir, no? Oo, oh, mukhang nawala siya. Sir Jerry? Hello. Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, okay, sorry. Um, so where was I? Ah, the vertical, this is a vertical profile of the aerosols. So what we saw was around, indeed, around two to three kilometers high, there's a high level of aerosols that... Um, Sir Jerry, nawawala yung audio niya. Naroon ata ang problema si Sir. Nawawala yung kanyang... Oops, na wala na siya. Okay, wait lang. Ah, 
Sir Jerry, okay lang kayo? Hello? Yes. Hello? Ayun. Yes, yes. Okay. Sorry. sorry, sorry about that. Um, okay, sige. Okay. So, yun nga, um, we're actually seeing yung biomass burning from Indochina, but it's a loft. But anyway, uh, once you reach the northern part of the Philippines, there's a, what you call, downwash. Bumababa pa rin siya. So, some of the the biomass burning um, emissions, they still reach the ground uh, in northern Philippines. Um, looking at the carbon dioxide data, kasi yung CTCon actually measures carbon dioxide, um, but aside from carbon dioxide, it also measures methane, H2O, and carbon monoxide. So essentially, for ano siya, carbon dioxide, ah, for greenhouse gas monitoring talaga siya. So we also saw some uh, increases, uh, particularly for CO2, uh, significant increase up to around uh, more than 40%. So which tells us na ano nga siya, uh, uh, biomass burning emission siya. So we have a paper on this um, on the Tikon Philippines, which is a first Tikon site for uh, for the tropical Pacific. So we have a we we have a conceptual model on springtime flow of um, pollutants in in the Philippines. So ang nangyari if you have the high pressure over China, so that's a continental high. And then you have a low pressure south of Japan. Uh, nagkakaroon sila ng confluent flow that pushes uh, wind from Northeast Asia and the Korean Peninsula towards the uh, Philippines. It's not only towards the Northern Philippines. The model, it shows that uh, the eastern part of the Philippines is also affected, but um, we don't have measurements on that. So, mahirap pa sabi for now. Then aloft, around 2 to 3 kilometers, we also have movement of this pollutant. So pollutants from mainland China, they move eastward. Uh, so sometimes tinatamaan nila yung ano eh, uh, Japan and Korea. But uh, turns out that uh, there's also movement, eastward movement from into China. They go up because of the mountains here. They move aloft and then move uh, uh, over the Philippines. And some of some of the biomass burning emissions actually they can go down into the surface. So it's really the winter monsoon season that drives it, this uh, long-range transport of air pollution. But um, there are other studies showing that during the during Habagat season, there's also transport from Southeast Asia. Uh, pero ang nangyayari kasi, since it's rainy during the Habagat season, so even if there's transport from Southeast Asia going to, to the Philippines, they get washed out of the rain in South China Sea or West Philippine Sea. So rainfall is a significant factor in the transport of um, these air pollutants. Uh, so one of the questions that I, I get asked often is, what can we do? So can we stop this transport? And the short answer is no, we can't. But just like in the global emissions na problem, yun tayo, for example, uh, we are affected by climate change, but um, we really don't emit a lot of carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases. And what we can do is to nudge or debuff, uh, force the other countries, large emitters, to, to minimize their emission. So yun lang talaga magagawa natin. And it's the same thing for, I think, for air pollutants. Um, so we have uh, several papers on this. Um, although hindi explicitly sinasabi yung long-range uh, pollution transport uh, pero ito, ito yung uh, papers that uh, we we wrote uh, on this transport so this project was supported by the DOSCP shared Mecoteco and then yung uh, TICO naman is supported by the Ministry of Energy and the National Institute for Environmental Studies in Japan so just to summarize uh, the TICO site we have a TICON site in Northern Philippines, so it um, it's used for validating satellite data, particularly in GOSAT of JAXA and the OCO2 um, uh, the satellite of NASA. Um, so the study shows signal of long-range transport. So before this study, we actually didn't know if um, pollutants from East Asia um, or even Southeast Asia, if they can reach the Philippines, and now we actually do. So. While the 
transboundary pollution signal is strong, um, the pollutant concentration is still well within national standards. So we actually need to still focus on local emissions rather than global emissions. And then the um, uh, complexity requires more observation. So not only the complexity in the emissions themselves. So once uh, pollutants are emitted, they also react chemically in the atmosphere. So makes it very complex. But also the complex uh, weather systems that we have in the region uh, makes it very difficult to, to measure all of this. So in-depth knowledge is actually needed for local, not only local, but also for regional and global weather. And then the emission patterns uh, from the source, uh, emission patterns from China mainly uh, towards the Philippines. Uh, we also need to know a lot of uh, these things. Um, and we need to use a suite of um, uh, methods essentially uh, using weather modeling, using remote sensing, using chemical analysis and so on to, to synthesize all of this that uh, we are measuring and to make sense of it. Um, and I think it's, a, it's still a niche here in the Philippines, especially for rele relevant government agencies. So as an example, recently, uh, yung Taal volcano, for example, uh, nagbubuga siya. So, si Fivox, uh, of course, they're experts of volcanoes. So, they know what's happening with the volcano. They know the amount of emission. But once the emission is in the air already, hindi na nila sakop yun. So, it becomes pag-asa. Pag-asa, however, uh, although they are experts in wind, wind direction, and so on, Si emission hindi lang naman siya, it, it doesn't rely only on wind. So it disperses, it has chemical reaction, and so on. So dito naman papasok si EMB. Si EMB, it measures um, pollutants on the surface. Pero once they are in the air pa, doing things that they do, uh, hindi rin gaanong sakop ni EMB. So in short, things like long-range transport of pollutants, hindi siya masakop ng iisang agency. And I think, like yung sa, yun na, pagka may biomass burning in in Malaysia or Indonesia umaabot dito, walang makasagot directly. Uh, yung, yung volcano, wala rin makasagot directly. Uh, Long-range transport, hindi rin ano kasi kulang sa each. Dapat nakasynthesize siya. So I think um, there's things to be done here in the Philippines to try to connect these three and dapat, I, I suppose dapat pag-usap usap sila. So that's it. That's my presentation. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank um, you. So, Ting, ako muna ulit? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, are there any questions from the audience, from the listeners? Uh, while well, they are thinking, so yeah. may, so, para <laughs> nakaka ano nakaka ano ba tawo nito nakaka amaze o nakaka yung yung pinaka end mo na summary. Considering na at least very states, wala pa rin tayong agency sa government or para para masagot yung mga maranasan natin eh, because of these pollutants. So. Member ka ba ng something of this committee that can actually suggest to our government in relation to this uh, to be able for us to have this uh, produce this uh, model or predictions etc something? I uh, hindi po. <laughs> uh, uh, although uh, I think um, yun, sa pag-asa we have uh, yung IESM our institute have a uh, good relationship with pag-asa. So in terms of yung sa modeling, I, I, we do work with pag-asa, uh, pero mainly it's, it's on the ano, weather, eh, paminsan lang yung sa pollutants. But uh, we also work with DNR EMB, but um, it's more on the ground pa rin, not, not the transport. So, uh, pero we have plans with EMB to, to talk to them about yung weather. So parang yun yung kulang sa EMBA, it's a weather. And then sa pag-asa naman, 
yung alam ng EMB. So trying to connect the two. Yeah, we we are working with them individually pero as to whether kung may malaking uh, may organization that encompasses everybody wala po. Ah, uh, baka maka ano dito siguro ang paasa nitong ano, scientific organization in relation to that. Kasi very important ka actually say eh. Kasi di ba, katulad ng pinakita mo na yung sa diliman, di ba, ang ganda-ganda na ng condition, so possibly doon. Pero, ang kapal-kapal pa ng, ng pollutants. Yes, yes. Okay. So yun, oh, I mean, dami na ng trees, parang manamig, sarap yung hangin, pero yung ini-inhale pa lang ng mga na, na dyan sa area is, gano'n na ka. So, pero an- ano, i-clear ko rin po na in fact sa Diliman inside the campus is lower compared to say if you go to uh, Filcoa. In fact, malayo ah. siya. Oo. So I so did... My... Yes, yes there's, there's a difference. Yeah. So most likely the the trees there help this uh, particular... Ano? Mm, ano mer- meron, meron, meron siyang tulong pero but still, it's, it's still high. Questions from the audience? Sir Jun, may tanong po kayo? Meron si Ma'am Vivian. Okay, sorry. Ma'am Vivian, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. So if this is a very good presentation in terms of its uh, impact no, sa policy recommendation. So studying transboundary pollution is in fact, uh, well, very important in terms of siguro controlling pollution. Uh, have you tried uh, recommending it to LGU, say for instance, limbawa nakita mo yung pollutants would extend as far as uh, different municipalities po. So uh, in terms of policy recommendation, have you tried uh, this effort no, uh, recommending um, um, policies to LGU, say for instance? Yeah, yung my colleague, Dr. Cayetano, she's the one uh, working with uh, EMB, for example, in in uh, drafting policies. So in, in a way, yes, pero yung EMB kasi on a national level, uh, for for LGUs, hindi ganong interested yung mga sa mga rural na lugar like sa Ilocos. Eh. Pero dito sa Metro Manila, say uh, Manila or Quezon City, they are in fact very interested and um yeah we're we're also working with them uh, they want to put up their own mga measurement sites kasi medyo kulang yun sa EMB uh, so yun ganun ganun po ah uh, thank you Jared pero yung ano yung pinakita mo ito itong equipment na to magkano yan sa i mean how many ah. million pesos and then uh, it, it, no? <laughs> uh, this is around the uh, 1 million pesos so some some others i actually borrowed from my taiwanese collaborator so we also measured kasi ano eh, uh, mercury in air uh, na meron din nanggagaling from china pero it's uh, outside of this study uh, so binaro ko lang to tapos sinend ko pabalik sa kanila. But uh, essentially itong measurements that uh, I've been doing, I've been also doing measurements in Metro Manila, for example, using this equipment. So it's around 1 million pesos. Kaso, ang problem, mahal yung chemical analysis. So each each time na magka-chemical analysis for, for each filter, it costs around 20,000 pesos. So medyo mahal siya. considering the health ng population so baka hindi na masaya ganun ka oh, oh yes yes of oh, opo oh, tama <laughs> ganun siguro pagtingin sana ng ating government so any more from the audience um hello po sir ting if i may just ask po final up question go sir kevin uh, sir jerry uh, yung analysis or yung chemical analysis po ba are i think ano outsource siya uh, sa labas siya pinapagawa and the quest, second question is do we can we have that same skill set in the future because the Philippines given our current na situation? 
Uh, yeah, um, so yung, yeah, yung chemical analysis, yung collaborator ko sa Taiwan, uh, complete yung lab niya. So what we did was, uh, we did we actually did simultaneous measurements in southern Taiwan and northern Philippines. So hindi ko na sinama rito. So complete yung lab niya, so I just send the filters to him and then he does the analysis. Tapos, um, yes, yung mga equipment na to, in fact, um, some of them meron. Um, Pero halimbawa, for example, yung sa elemental car, yung carbonaceous particles, si PNRI lang meron dito. And mo, many times that I ask them, may problem yung machine. So like, like ganun, ganun yung mga problems. Eh. So kailangan, ang mas mabilis talaga is to just send it abroad and have it analyzed somewhere else. Pero in fact, yung mga equipment, meron tayo. Uh, thank you very much, Pastor Jerry, for your sure, answer. Sure, sure. Any more? So, kung wala naman, Sir June, so siguro mag-closing na tayo. Okay, okay, Sir Ting. Okay, so for the, all of the participants who log in, we're going to provide you a certificate for your attendance and participation in this uh, webinar. And hoping to uh, that you'll get interested in other webinars that the PAASA will be doing. So as mentioned, uh, just Google the the website so you can uh, find uh, some interesting topics that you wanted to uh, watch or see, or you may want also want to contact some of these uh, scientists that are situated uh, globally. So with that, thank you very much for your attendance and have a good day. Stay safe. Thank you, Ting. Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Lin. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Giselle. Okay, yung presentation mo, Jara. Naiba, pero ang ganda-ganda. Pero makatulong siguro yan sa amin sa mga ano, inaaral namin sa dagat ng mga pollutants. <laughs> Opo. Pero wala bang, wala bang way na, for example, Kaya nga, mahal nga siya yung... Kasi di ba sa North Luzon lang kayo nagtingin? Mm -hmm. O okay, siguro baka maganda rin meron sa Visayas, Mindanao, no? Actually, yun nga po yung gusto ko sa UP Visayas at saka sa around Western Mindanao para tingnan yung mga nanggagaling sa Southeast Asia na biomass burning. Yeah. Pwede sana yun. Pag may forest fire sa Borneo. Opo, opo, yun. Oh, yun, yun, yun exactly. Yeah. Okay, so again, thank you. Thank you, okay, everyone. Thank you, thank you, Pa. Thank you, thank, thank you, you, King. Thank you, June.